Hey, good evening. My name is Justin. If we haven't met yet, there are a few of you. A few, a few of you. My inner southerner's coming out. Um, there are a few of you I have not met because you're brand new tonight, and there are a few of you who are just brand new to me. So uh, my name is Justin. I get the honor of being the student pastor here. I'm so glad you guys are here. Uh, we're starting a brand new series tonight. Um, the title is To Live as Christ. I actually took that directly out of the book of Philippians. And I'm going to kind of try and harness our whole series around this phrase. Like, what does it mean to live as Christ? You see, we ended a couple of weeks ago in a series called Fear. And we talked about all the ways that fear tries to take us out and how we, we wrestle through it. We kind of ended on the idea that a faith in Jesus brings us out of death and into life. So then if we're in life, how do we live? What does it mean to live is Christ? And so we're going to look at Paul's words. Actually, we're going to teach this series a little bit differently. So typically, like last month's series was like more of a topical teaching. I picked a topic. I said, all right, we're going to talk about fear. We're going to do it for a whole month. And I grabbed from like Daniel and First Kings and we jumped to the New Testament. So this whole series, if you were at Fall Retreat, the way they taught at Fall Retreat was they took a book. And they went line by line, chapter by chapter. And so I have taken on the challenge of going line by line and chapter by chapter. And so we buckle up. We're going to move really fast through some of these. Like tonight, we're going to cover 30 verses in hopefully 25 minutes, okay? Or less. You guys ready for that? Cool. <laughs> Two strategies that I want to share with you, because here's the other heartbeat behind this, is some of you have come up to me after oh, on a Wednesday night and been like, hey, how do I read my Bible? How do I actually like sit down, get with it, and learn more about it? And so I want to share two strategies. They're acronyms. The first is HEAR, H-E-A-R, HEAR. <clears throat> it should be on the screen in a second. So the HEAR strategy, gracias, is a highlight. So you take a piece of scripture, you highlight a single verse. E is examine. You take that verse and you essentially pull out of it, look at the verbs and the nouns, and you're like, okay, if, if it's Paul writing this, and you, you examine what is the meaning of this verse? What is the meaning? And then apply. You take that and you say, okay, now how does this work in my life? So for example, if we were to highlight the most infamous of all verses, John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son who believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, right? And so if you examine that, you break it down and go, okay, so it says that God loved the world. That means everybody, and not just like in one point of time, but like across time. And if this is true, then the next piece says that he sent his only son. Okay, so he sends Jesus, because I know about this Jesus guy. And then some people would have life and not death. That's your examination, right? You're not changing scripture. You're not trying to figure out some deeper meaning. You're just kind of breaking it down to more manageable chunks. And then the A is the apply. All right, if this is true... A, do I accept this? And then B, what does it look like for me to live as though God loves everybody around me? And that he sent, my, he sent his son to die for them. And then the R is respond. And that typically for me has always been a prayer. I always write down, dear God, like for this case, it'd be like, God, man, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus for me. Thank you for loving others and Jesus for them. I pray that I will help point people to you and to your son. So this is one strategy. The second strategy is SOAP. Some of you may have heard of SOAP. So it's the same concept. Instead of highlight, it's just S for scripture. What's your verse? O, observe. Same thing as examine. Who's talking? What are they talking about? What's going on? A is apply. How can you walk that out? How can you work with that? And then P, pray. And so this helps you break down pieces of scripture. This helps you practice spiritual disciplines, of both reading and prayer. And here's why I bring these up. Because starting tonight... Through the end of this month, through November 30th, which is the last Wednesday that we're together in the month of November, I, other than Sundays, because y'all should be sitting with me in church on Sundays on the front. If you don't have a church home, 1115 most Sundays, 1030 this coming Sunday, all right? Um, I'm going to be posting a verse, a piece of verses from Philippians. I have found a way to chop it up across a calendar. And so if you just look on the Instagram story every day starting tonight, all the way through November 30th, ignoring Sundays because you should be in church, okay? Um, you will have read, not just here on Wednesday nights, but also in your own quiet time, the entire book of Philippians. And so I would encourage you, that can be your highlight, that can be your scripture piece of both soap and or here. And on top of that, 
We've given you each a copy of Philippians, so that way whenever you're here with us during the series, you can have it right here in front of you. I try to make the margins nice and wide so you can take all kinds of notes like I do sometimes. Also, if you're like, well, I don't like writing in the side margins, that's okay, I gave you the backs. If it's not enough, I will happily give you more paper to take notes. Cool? Cool, all right. So here's, here's the challenge. We're gonna cover a lot of verses tonight, and my best friend thought that it was too much, all right? So I'm gonna challenge y'all and say y'all can handle it, because the win is actually if you just take away one thing, all right? I'm absolutely cool with it if you only take away one thing from this whole first chapter of Philippians, because the beauty of it is, you hopefully will follow the reading plan, and whatever you miss tonight, you'll catch it there. Or you can go back and watch this on YouTube later and catch it then. Cool? Ready? All right. Philippians 1, starting in verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and the deacons. So immediately what's happening is we are introduced to who is writing the book and to whom they are writing the book. It's kind of like a little bit of English class. So we have Paul and Timothy. And so Paul is this church planner, he's this missionary, he writes most of our New Testament, and the cool story about Paul is he used to be a Christian killer. He used to be a Jesus hater. Man, he was like religious about it, in fact. And like he was always going off, he's killing Christians all in the name of, his, in the name of God, and he's getting after it, and God's like, come on, Paul, you missed it. And so Jesus meets him on what's called the Damascus Road and blinds him, literally, um, for a few days, and then he, Paul just like turns his life around. He's like, oh my goodness, I am doing this all backwards and wrong. Becomes the greatest missionary of all time. To know this today, that is great news because there's some of us who think that we are so far gone or have done so many horrible, terrible things, there's no way God can use us. I'm telling you, if God can use a guy who's literally killing his own people to then share the gospel more than anybody else in the first church, the first century church, that God can use you too, regardless of where you're at. All right, verse two. Oh, and he's writing to the church of Philippi. I should clarify, this is the first church plant that Paul had ever planted, and so he's kind of writing them like a check-in letter um, and trying to give some encouragement. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is actually a common greeting that you will find if you go and look in like Ephesians 1-2, Galatians 1-3, and Colossians 1-2. You'll begin noticing a rhythm that in most of the letters to the New Testament churches, in this first century churches, you're going to find grace and peace. There's only a few books, Hebrews being one of them, because they believe Hebrews is more like a big sermon. And the second one, I think James doesn't quite start with grace and peace. James just kind of comes in swinging. Um, but Paul typically will start, hey, grace and peace. And I wonder, as I read that, I remember, I, I remember there being that repetition throughout these letters. Man, what would it look like if we communicated to each other, beginning with grace and peace? What if we started the way we talked to each other by, by issuing a declaration of grace and peace? That's what Jesus did for us. He offers a grace that we did not deserve. He did for us what we could not do for ourselves. So that the end result would be a peace with God the Father. There are people in your lives, what would it look like if when you approach them, you're like, hey, I'm going to give some grace because I'm actually mad at you right now. And I really just want to like tear you up, give you a new one, dish it out. What would it look like if you said, but I actually want to extend grace. I want to have this hard conversation so that there can be peace. What would it look like if your conversations began with grace and peace? Verse three. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. So he's like commending the Philippians. He's like giving a pat on the back. He's like, man, every time I think of you guys, I'm just so filled with joy. Y'all doing the right thing. Y'all keeping the faith. And listen, there were some churches that Paul planted that he'd hear about and he'd be like, oh, my goodness. He'd still be like, grace and peace, but it's going to be some tough grace. Like, y'all got to clean up your act. With Philippians, he's like, man, y'all are doing great. I'm just I'm so filled with joy when I think about you. Pat on the back. Good job. They also partnered with Paul. They're supporting him. They're praying for him. And then he says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. And that's the idea of that because they're following Jesus, God has begun this good work in them. When you, when you put your faith in Jesus, 
you begin this, this journey of what's called sanctification. And it actually doesn't complete until you're with Jesus or the day that he comes back. And sanctification is just this big, large, fancy word for boys. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Becoming more and more like Jesus. Okay? And so it, he says, but I, you know, I thank God because eventually that good work in you will be completed. There are some of us in here who we've put our faith in Jesus, but we keep struggling with this tension of, I know what to do, but I really have a hard time doing it. Or I know what I shouldn't do, and yet I keep doing that thing. And you're caught in this tension of, I believe in Jesus, but I'm also struggling over here. Friends, this is an encouragement that you're a work in progress, okay? God will complete that good work. There's just seasons where there's pruning. There's seasons of that tension between your flesh and what God has called you into. Verse 7. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. Whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. So because of the support of the Philippians, the way they share in Paul's ministry, he's like, hey, I just, it'd be so much better if I was just with you guys instead of here in prison. Prison stinks. Okay, and so he's, it's just kind of like you with your friends. You're like, I hate doing homework. I'd rather be with you guys because y'all are awesome and y'all are always encouraging me. And it's another reminder that life is better in community. Paul's not talking about how awesome he is doing alone. He's like, hey, I just really want to be in community, being encouraged and, and helping encourage you guys. All right, verse 9. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Fill the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So verse 9, he begins with this prayer. And he's, he's, he's praying that the Philippians' faith would grow, that their love for Jesus and for others would grow, that their righteousness, the fruits of walking with Jesus would grow and become deeper, that, that insight that they would have a deeper understanding of the love of Jesus. This is something that we should all be praying over each other, that as we walk with Jesus, we begin to understand him more and grow deeper and plant those roots and then he gives us this encouragement. He's like, hey, I know prison sounds really bad, but actually I got to use my chains to declare Christ. He said the whole palace guard means everybody who is like watching him. It means that Paul just kept nagging them. Hey, hey, have you met Jesus? Hey, I know this guy named Jesus. And he died for me. He died for you. And then he rose again. The whole palace guard. And I was like, oh man, Paul, he just won't stop talking about Jesus. And because of this, these other believers in the area are hearing about it, and they're like, well, if Paul can be in prison and still be that bold, then surely in my freedom, I can be bold to share Christ. And so the brothers and sisters, the people around them, the community in Rome are encouraged by this, and they begin to share the gospel without fear. I wonder who would be inspired by you if you began to, even in your hardships, proclaim Christ. Who, who would begin to pick up the mantle and say, even if he can do it while his parents are going through a divorce, or she can do it while her grades might be crumbling, even though she's studying to no end, but it's because there's some other stuff going on. Who else would be inspired and be like, well, all I've got is I'm not the best at tennis. I, I can share Jesus. I can do that too. What would happen in your schools? All right. Verse 15. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. So some people are preaching Christ because of a rivalry or an envy. And essentially, they're looking at Paul and the, the ability of influence he's got, the way he's planning. He's like, man, I want to have that much influence. And so they begin preaching Jesus, but their heart motive is out of this place of like jealousy or competition. 
And I'm not going to lie to you, when I read this, I think of American church. I think of us, especially here in the South. Well, that, that church has a great kids program, and this one has that band, and they got this speaker, and they do these events, and that one gives away AirPods at youth group, and this one gives away pizza for a dollar, right? We begin to compare and contrast, and it's like, well, it's still on the name of Jesus, but it's his rivalry. What about in your lives? Do you declare Jesus publicly on your social media, but almost out of a place of, right? well, they went, they went to that camp, and they had these speakers, Right. I went to this concert and loved these people. The name of Jesus. And Paul's like, yo, it doesn't even bother me. These guys trust me, but it doesn't bother me because it's all about Jesus. Can we at least just get to a place where we're not bothered by what some other church or other youth group or other people around us are doing? Because I'll be the first repenter in the room to say, I easily follow the envy piece. I follow some of the most influential churches, pastors, youth pastors, and student ministries on this planet. And they're all doing awesome things. And it is so easy for me to go, well, no wonder they're doing, they got all those students there because they're giving away Jordans. Like, who does that? It's crazy, right? And over here, like, I can't give, I can give away Vans, maybe. Like, I don't know, right? It's so easy, but I have to remind myself that it's not about that. And so I wrote this statement on my whiteboard. If you ever come visit me in my office, you are more than welcome to do. I have this statement on my whiteboard. It says this, preach the gospel, die, be forgotten. Preach the gospel, die, be forgotten. And for me, it's a reminder that it's not about me. It's just about Jesus. And that's what Paul says. He goes, what does it even matter? Because the important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, he's going to rejoice because he still wins because Jesus is still proclaimed. I hope that we get to a place where no matter what, it's just that Jesus is proclaimed. Verse 19. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will be in no way ashamed but have sufficient courage so now that, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. So Paul starts off by saying, hey, no matter what, I got full confidence going to be delivered. If you were here for like week one or two of Fear Not, we talked about the lion, the, the fiery furnace. Remember I told you, the boys of the king, they're like, listen, king, no matter what, God's delivered us out of your hand. Whether it's through death and we get to go to heaven and be with God, or he protects us in the fire, it's the same deal. So Paul's like, listen, I can be set free, and I'm going to keep preaching the gospel. And he goes, and even if not, for me to live is Christ, the, the furthering of the gospel, to die, I get to be with Jesus. And that is where he wants to be, and that is awesome. Jesus is far greater than anything here on this earth. And for Paul, he's like, kill me. I get to go be with my Savior. But he just is concerned that regardless of the outcome that Christ is exalted, that it's never about Paul, that it's always about Christ. And sometimes we are consumed with exalting and glorifying ourselves. When you wake up in the mornings, there is a question you should challenge yourself with. Is to live Christ or is to live JD? Is, is to live Ben, Miles? Is to live uh, Grant? You have to not find out your Grant. I thought Thomas, other Thomas. He's like, I'm not paying attention. Right? Is to live me. Is it going to always be all about me? Or is to live Jesus? Because I'll tell you right now, I make a horrible God. I make a horrible Lord. I will always let myself down. That's the question. Is to live actually going to be Christ in your life? Will you be surrendered to him and trust him and follow him? Is he your Savior and your Lord? Or are you to keep trusting in yourself to keep you through storms that you can't handle by yourself? Verse 23, I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. There should be a desire to be with Jesus, 
to, to eventually come into that perfect peace and comfort. But while we're here, Jesus is using us. And it's to be in community and to encourage the community. And Paul's not trying to brag. And he's like, hey, if I get to be with you, your faith is going to abound. He's just saying that I can't wait to come to you and to encourage you because after I'm gone, you will go further. You will do more for the kingdom than I'm doing in this place. And that's my prayer for you guys is that long after I'm gone, that you will run with the banner of the gospel much further than I, than I did at an even younger age than me. Last verses. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. We're called, just like the Philippians, to live worthy of the gospel. When we live worthy, others are going to see, and they're going to hear, and they're going to be encouraged. Jesus never promised an easy life, but it is a worthy life. It's a life full of hope. And then Paul also notes some unity, standing firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. And when we strive together, we'll have a less fear of sharing the gospel. He says, standing strong together for one faith without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. The more you come together and share as a group, the less fear there will be in sharing and talking about Jesus. And we see this already. Some of you guys get together to do FCA on Friday mornings, right? As you come here in this place, you aren't scared to talk about Jesus. You can actually be able to. And, and, and encouraged to talk about and live out and think about Jesus. Start walking out your lives in every avenue that way. You do not struggle alone. So, I'm going to wrap it up. Here's a few quick things in case you kind of got distracted that you can learn from chapter 1 of Philippians. Number one, let our talk begin with grace and peace. Let our talk begin with grace and peace. Number two, be encouraged. We are a work in progress. It's okay if you get knocked down. It's okay if you fail. What's not okay is if you don't get back up. What's not okay is if you don't keep going. Keep running the race set before you. Number three, our trials can encourage others for the sake of the gospel. Number four, community matters. And fear has no power in community. The more of you there are, the less it, the fear will matter and have a, have a voice. But if you're all by yourself, Fear is very, very loud. And then number five, to live as Christ. Let your life radiate Jesus. Reed is going to come back up here and sing one more song. The front is open for response. I don't know what your response looks like this morning. You can feel free to kneel here this morning. I don't even know what day it is, apparently. Feel free to kneel and pray. Feel free to grab a, a small group leader and talk. Feel free to read the scriptures out as we sing through this last. Are you sitting over here? Okay, not what we talked about <laughs> as we sing through this last song. And if you've never given your life to Christ, don't, don't play that game. God's calling, God's knocking. He's Savior first. That's the starting line. Okay? He died for you. He did for you what you cannot do for yourself. Please grab an adult tonight and talk to them about this decision or a trusted friend before you leave. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing. Dear God, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for your scripture. Thank you that it can be an encouragement. Thank you that it can, it can be conviction. Thank you for these students who are willing to show up on Wednesday nights and boldly proclaim that they are at least interested in hearing more about you, that they want to learn how to live a life more like your son. I pray tonight that if there's a student who has questions, that they would not hide those questions because there's no fear in community, that they would come and ask them and hopefully find the answers they're looking for. So in Jesus' name I pray, amen.